and uh, welcome. I am India Block. I am the lead reporter at Design, the online architecture and design magazine. And we're here in Frankfurt for Ish uh, 2019, the bathroom trade fair. And um, Design is chairing this panel tonight with Grower. And this coincides with the launch of their new product, the Icon 3D, which I believe is the world's first 3D printed tap. So, joining me is Patrick Schumacher of Zaha Hadid Architects, Marius Miking of Snohetta, Filippo Gildardo of MX3D, and Michael Sayum of Grower. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves properly in just a moment. Um, and then we are going to have a panel discussion about how robotics, artificial intelligence, all this kind of technology, generative design, and um, additive manufacturing are really shaping the world that we're living in now and in the very near future. Um, so, Patrick, can I start you off if I hand you your clicker? Okay, my name is Patrick Schumacher, principal of Zadi Architects. We're based in London, we're a global design firm operating on all scales. I believe in a built environment that becomes creative and spontaneous and interactive with respect to the social process it is ordering, uh, but at the same time shaping and more and more actively shaping. For that, we start to research not only into new manufacturing uh, forms, but also into semiological systems of design, but also responsive environments which make it happen, in particular looking at work environments for now. But I think the similar events could also happen in, in, in retail and, and, and entertainment environments, and potentially in certain amount types uh, of emerging types of residential environment as well, like co-living, uh, uh, connected up with co-working, etc. So very open textures, and um, I'm happy to be here and discuss these issues. Great, thank you, Patrick. And uh, Marius, if you'd like to give us a brief overview. Yeah, I'm uh, Marius from uh Snurta. We at Snurta in uh, different disciplines try to or, uh, work towards defining meaning um, and the tools that we use, ideally through uh, dialogue, through, uh, through collaboration, and utilizing technology and uh, the inherent knowledge that is in our team and our collaborators' team. Great, thank you, Marius. And Filippo? I'm Filippo. I'm uh, R&D leader of MX3D. We are a startup 3D printing company currently focusing on uh, metal 3D printing of uh, large parts. 3D printing and the state of the art in many different techniques can help to disrupt the, the world of design, engineering and architecture. Thanks. And Michael? Hi. Michael Siem. I'm Vice President of Design for Grow, and my job is very simply to shape the future of water. I work with a tremendously talented team uh, to do that, and we've really demonstrated how we're going to do that with new additive manufacturing techniques uh, and what the future holds with additional manufacturing capabilities of 3D printing. Thank you, Michael. And um, so my first question, really, for the panel is, um, we are creating environments here for human beings, but these environments are often being created by robots, by algorithms, by artificial intelligence. And how do you keep the human centered in that experience? At the end of the day, these are the, the people that are going to be living in these buildings or using these products. And I wondered if perhaps, Patrick, you could start us off, because you are often working at such a vast scale. How do you keep the human centered in your designs? Indeed, we try, and the question is really how one can have innovation and radical innovation and yet have a sense of how this might be acceptable and viable and meaningful for audiences. And because if you go with a more traditional approach, you always have precedent and you know what you're getting and there isn't a big problem. On the level of complexity, we took a, uh, talk about large projects, large corporate campuses for Google or a big airport. The only way I've discovered we can actually credibly know what we're doing and have the user experience 
uh, at heart is through simulating the experience. So this would be visually through animation, through VR, but also the, not only the individual experience, but the effects of a large agglomeration and interaction of people in spaces becomes important. Trying to simulate how people would move, gather, and interact. And of course, for that, we need to have experience. We need to tap into our own reflective knowledge about social spaces and interaction situations. And we need to know what the criteria of success would be. And that is something, a new research and development paradigm, a new sophisticated way of working with clients and with um, simula new simulation capacities which home in on social functionality and experience. Uh, you can't just close your eyes and imagine what happens at that level of complexity. So this new form of crowd modeling and agent-based life process modeling is our way to make it human-centered. And you can, of course, from model generation to model generation, make that more tailored because these crowds aren't homogenous, they're differentiated with respect to client groups, status groups, various characters and social roles, and their cultural habits. You can encode in the agent, and also from space to space, the scenario and situation expectations shift. You know, the different spaces between a public space, a private space, a semi-public space, a lecture hall, a library, they all come with their social codes and sets of expectations, and that makes it quite complex. It's not only evacuation and circulation, but it's uh, a whole field of potential experiences we want to have and move quickly in between, and that's a huge challenge, but the point is, yes, it's human-centered, but more than that, it is social process-oriented. It's a life process and communication-oriented. We're coming to urban centers to be with each other, to co-locate, cooperate, to have a flourish of information as well as skill networks. That's why we're drawn into the big city, to be close to many things and switch each day, each afternoon, we have maybe, I mean, I'm, my life is like, and most of my people's life are this, we have many different experiences. So that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, Marius, I kind of wondered how that fit in with your and Snohata's principles, because I know that you are looking at ways of making technology meaningful. Um, does that kind of idea of scale gel with your methods? Um. It may very well. I'm not going to uh, <laughs> debate Patrick on, uh, on social meeting places. Um, I, think, um, I think the human-centered approach is very close for us. Um, and uh, and uh, recognizing that uh, change is fundamentally um, unpleasant for most people is, is something that we constantly have to put into our mindset when we're doing new things. So if we can create meaning, if we know that we're doing things uh, due to a very certain reason or um, um, a story or something we want to take people with, um, I think that would help. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Filippo? Because you've, you've created this bridge. This is something that's never been done before. Um, were people quick to trust it? Well, yeah, definitely. The, <laughs> the reason why we created the bridge is to make something that people could use. We didn't make a demonstrator for the engineering world or the architecture world. It's something for everybody to try out. I'm pretty confident in the, <laughs> in the structural integrity of the product. That's why the sensor network is in place. So we made some calculation based on some simulated input. And the sensor network is going to tell us if First of all, the input were correct and the simulation was correct and the use that the people will do of this structure actually um, is what we, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to have. I mean, I don't think we need to answer necessarily whether people like it right away or whether they buy into an aesthetic. I think we need to be market leaders as well. So people should learn to love this bridge because downstream it is lighter and more efficient than a kind of traditional welded up trust of I-beams and we should start learn to hate those because they're wasteful of time, material, energy. So that's why we need aesthetic revolutions 
And the same as with these, the buildings we're kind of offered, they initially might be alien, but if they allow you to learn to navigate and be close with many other people, many events in a mixed use kind of ordered environment, you will learn the empowerment of that quite quickly. So I think we have to, uh, we have to be leading and market leaders uh, with respect to the morphology spaces. And we have to, you know, it's, it's, it's not good being kind of sitting with your own uh, prejudices and predilections. And for instance, if you hate cities and you withdraw into the suburbs, you will stunt your career and you will be kind of semi or unproductive. And so you have to also l develop that lust for complexity, that lust for uh, um, changefulness in your, in, in your career path and your situations to be thriving, and that's also a social learning. And you also have to, you know, have to, uh, even the mindset of the 1950s uh, would be utterly dysfunctional today. Um, um, and, and that's what we have to, we can't kind of naturalize the kind of human nature and, and, and presume that people like certain things, like human scale or coziness or timber, <laughs> something like this. Uh, uh, that's not going to help us. So we need to first kind of develop uh, an understanding which environments allow us to flourish if we acquire the, the, the user skills. I mean, that's leadership. Uh, and, and, and people are adapting to this. I mean, if they're, they're, they've, they've taken on the internet and living with electronic media uh, because it makes their life more, um, empowers them. Yeah, also I think uh, we have to uh, remember that, especially when it comes to um, urban, the, the, the look of a city, it's something that it's imposed to the citizen. It's not something that is chosen. It's up to, to the, the studio that creates something to educate the, the citizen or the user. Uh, or just tease him with, uh, with something different or something new, show how the future might look like, because the future doesn't, by itself, it doesn't look like anything. It just, it will have the shape and the look that will decide ourselves. I think polarization in architecture and design is also a really good scenario, right? I think uh, we live in a society where you cannot please everyone, and I think we need to, to develop spaces that adapt uh, specific to the needs. I mean, we had some, some very, I mean, I'm in a very different situation. I'm not talking about large-scale residentials. I can prototype the objects that we're, we're talking about. I can test, I can see the consumer response. Yet, we can do that at a small scale, but the moment we reveal to the public, you get a lot of people trying to understand what's happening. And I think the role of design and architecture is to bring a level of newness into the discussion. We cannot rely on the past. We have to move forward. Uh, whether it's a large-scale residential might be uh, uh, something difficult to prototype, but that's where the role of simulation can come in. And we need to use technology to understand uh, behaviors. I think even the way water and large-scale infrastructure is still in a very traditional mindset. It's not, it's not following the user's patterns that might happen in a large-scale business. And this is a, you know, in a large-scale development. This might be an opportunity to add more intelligence. It's a, it's a learning curve. I mean, I mean I have given up plastic bottles a while ago, but I'm on glass bottles. But what I'm learning here, you need to develop this revulsion against plastic bottles. And it becomes a kind of sensibility you acquire. Um, and that then can kind of, consumers, I think, I trust, will learn this quickly. And if you can trust the product, and, and that's the whole thing about, about a critical um, investigative public with respect to your claims, uh, then I think we, uh, we, a, a radical new product can fly through the market. And that's the global market now. So that's why we have this fantastic opportunity where the great innovators, uh, when, if they make a move uh, that is picked up by millions and potentially billions, that's very empowering. And that's why this kind of startup culture is so, so fascinating uh, that we have living in that world of opportunity. Uh, and where many try to make this breakthrough and some of them will win and resources will flow back to do more. So it's a, it's a nice risk-taking atmosphere. 
And what about the environment itself? I mean, these technologies are amazing and they can do wonderful things, but uh, while there's infinite possibilities, we're becoming more and more aware of the finite resources, and that's great to hear that you've given up plastic water bottles and that, Michael, that you, there's no plastic water bottles here tonight and you are developing a tap that could kind of replace that. But these new technologies, is, is there a cost or does that cost you know, get overwritten by the benefit? Yeah, I, I think this is the role of design and architecture is to really address some of these large scale problems in society and embrace the technology to help solve this problem. And I think what's really impressive here is there's a lot of experimentation at very different levels. Um, and this is, I think, going to happen. We may not all get them right, but I think you've got to be hands-on. You've got to approach it. And uh, I'm, I'm personally open to technology. I mean, we have an amazing R&D department that's constantly experimenting, constantly giving the right tools to look at water as a precious resource. And you know, we talk about it as, a, as an element that's transformative. It can really change your state of mind, but it also can cause disastrous uh, implications. I mean, these can be, so we need to take control of, of, of water, whether it's through single use or in large scale management of buildings with more intelligence. I mean, I like this idea of, of the uh, data centers as, as heat pumps or something. <laughs> uh, so these are out of the box concepts which I find fascinating and, and um, I hope it will be taken up. I like if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I think that is pretty much all we have time for tonight. Um, thank you so much, Patrick, Marius, Filippo, and Michael. And uh, thank you for Grow for having us. And thank you to our super patient audience. And uh, great. I will hand you back to Jan and Michael. Mm -hmm.